When I say bronchi, you say ectasis. Bronchi, bronchi. <laughs> you know if you could sort of sit, no? Well, let's try it one more time. When I say bronchi, you say ectasis. Bronchi, bronchi. Okay, maybe not very interactive today. It's all right. Sorry for being a bit dry, but actually there is one variant of bronchiectasis called bronchiectasis sicca. So dryness is actually appropriate for this topic. <laughs> Hello everybody, it's Ryan here. Today we're chatting about bronchiectasis. This is an outline of the talk. We're going to be talking about a clinical case first up and then addressing bronchiectasis head on, talking about the etiologies, pathophysiology, clinical features, investigations, and how we manage it, and then closing with scripture. I hope you're well. Here we go, everybody. We got a 51 year old female complaining of dry cough, predictive of thick, tenacious green sputum. Yucky! The cough is worse when she first wakes up in the morning. At this time, there are occasional streaks of blood in the sputum. Oh dear, her cough began about seven years ago and has been progressively worsening with production of more voluminous sputum. She currently estimates that her cough uh, produces up to half a cup of sputum daily. She reports uh, frequently requiring antibiotics for low respiratory tract infections as well as sinus infections. Mm -hmm. Bilateral coarse crackles are heard in the lower lung zones. Clubbing is present. Pulmonary function tests demonstrate a forced expiratory volume in one second of 1.68, uh, which is 53.3% of predicted. That's in liters. A forced vital capacity of 3 liters, which is 75% predicted. And the FEV1 to FPC ratio of 56%. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh. A speech and culture grows here in monosodicinosa. Which test would you perform next in the evaluation of this patient? Is it A, a barium swallow? B, bronchoscopy, C, chest x-ray, D, high-resolution chest CT, or is it E, sweat chloride testing? Okay, everybody, what is bronchiectasis? Well, it is a term that refers to the permanent abnormal dilation of one or more bronchi with the destruction of the bronchial wall proximal to the terminal bronchioles. That's it, it's proximal to the terminal bronchioles. Outline causes of bronchiectasis, we have this handy mnemonic. Thank you so much to... The people over at nomage.com. I uh, recommend this uh, website. It's got a lot of helpful resources put together so well. So this is our uh, mnemonic for remembering the etiologies behind bronchiectasis. It's called a sick airway. A sick airway. So A speaks to an airway lesion, be it chronic obstruction, could be a foreign body. S speaks to sequestration. I is infection or inflammation, especially chronic infections like TB, pertussis, C is for cystic fibrosis and K for cartagenous syndrome. A sick airway, A speaks to ABPA, which is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. I speaks to immunodeficiencies. It could be hypogammaglobulinemia, it could be myeloma, it could be lymphoma, right? R speaks to reflux or inhalation injury. W is William Campbell syndrome and other congenital dyskinesia, ciliary dyskinesia. So you've got Mounier Quinn syndrome, you've got Young syndrome. A speaks to aspiration, and Y is yellow nail or young syndrome, right? So there you have it, guys. Etiologies of bronchiectasis, A, sick, airway. Thank you, nomage.com. Okay, but remember, by and large, the most common causes of bronchiectasis are in kids, post-measles, post-pertussis, which is whoop, 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 whooping cough. Whoop, there it is. In adults, it's obviously post-TB. Very, very common in our setting, right? Uh, righty, let's move on. What are the types of bronchiectasis? It could be saccular or cystic, which is the most severe. Then there's the cylindrical and the fusiform types, right? This is just an illustration outlining what this looks like, pathophysiologically speaking. This is a normal uh, bronchioles, right? Uh, and this is the cylindrical type. This is the varicose type. This is the cystic type, all right? Uh, outline the characteristics of the sputum in bronchiectasis as well. If the sputum is kept in a bottle, three layers are observed. So it kind of like fractionates and separates into three layers. The lower sediment contains epithelial debris and bacteria. Then we have the middle or the liquid layer, and then we have the upy, frothy layer. Okay, so this is what Tally and O'Connor has to say about bronchiectasis in terms of your approach to the clinical examination. All right, let's just get my pen in there. They say it is a pathological dilation of the bronchi, resulting in impaired clearance of mucus and hence anitis for chronic infection. History of chronic cough and of usually voluminous 
puddle and sputum since childhood is virtually diagnostic. Now signs, this is what we're going to look for, right? Most likely, you're going to see the patient in the context of an exacerbation of pre-existing bronchiectasis. So look out for systemic signs like fever, cachexia, sinusitis in some 70%. The sputum, as you mentioned, is puddle and foul smelling, voluminous, sometimes bloodstained. The breath sounds, but bronchiectasis classically gives you coarse, pan inspiratory or late inspiratory crackles over the affected lobe because it's coming from the airways. Signs of severe bronchiectasis are very copious amounts of sputum and hemoptysis, clubbing, cyanosis, widespread crackles, signs of airway obstruction, signs of respiratory failure, uh, which we know, of course, to be cyanosis and confusion. And that's because you have one failure. And type two failure, you can have the bounding pulse, all right, and you're going to have the uh, flushing. That speaks to CO2 retention, right? And core pulmonary, signs of secondary amyloidosis, example, edema from proteinuria, cardiac failure, enlarged liver and spleen, carpal tunnel syndrome. And here, they speak to causes being congenital versus acquired. But we've already covered this in our mnemonic. So how does interstitial lung disease, which is now termed diffuse parenchymal lung disease, DPLD, differ from bronchiectasis? Nice to ask. So in interstitial lung disease or in diffuse parenchymal lung disease, crepitations are usually bilateral, basal, and inspiratory. But the classic thing, guys, the giveaway, the seller, the poster child for DPLD or interstitial lung disease is the quality of the crepitations, described as dry, just like my jokes, or Velcro typing quality. And the classic thing is that it is unaltered. It is absolutely unaltered by coughing versus bronchiectasis, which is influenced by coughing. In DPLD, there is a history of persistent cough that may or may not be uh, associated with profuse expectoration and also progressively worsening dyspnea. How does pulmonary edema differ from bronchiectasis? Nice to ask. So in pulmonary edema, the first thing is that generally there's no clubbing, right? And uh, crepitations are usually fine and are present both during inspiration and expiration. Also, there's a history that alludes to cardiac disease, orthopnea, paroxysmal internal dyspnea, and a history suggestive of cardiac disease. Alrighty. So what is the significance of post tussive crepitations? So that means after the patient coughs. So it's crepitations that appear after cough, usually at the apex, and that is indicative of TB. Remember we said the TB loves the apices of the lungs because this is where ventilation is ideal and perfusion not that great. So that creates an ideal environment for thriving of your acid fast bacilli. What is bronchiectasis sicca? Quite dry, this one. <laughs> Just like me. Uh, it is a type of bronchiectasis in which a dry cough is associated with intermittent episodes of hemoptysis. Now, that hemoptysis may be massive, even life-threatening sometimes. The bleeding occurs from the bronchial vessels and is common among patients with granulomatous infections, such as tuberculosis, which has a predilection for the upper lobes. Alrighty, guys, what investigations should be done in bronchiectasis? So, the first part of call is a chest x-ray, PA view, posterior anterior view. What you're going to see is ring shadows with a clear center, so-called honeycombing. We're going to see examples coming up. Ring shadows with or without a fluid devil, which may be multiple. That's a cystic type. Linear streaks, which speaks to tram lines. Thickened bronchi, and that manifests as a signet ring or patchy opacity, but that's most seen on CT. So high-resolution CT, as you know, is our investigation of choice. All right, so here we can see what does the X-ray show, everybody? This is the X-ray PA view showing multiple ring shadows. Let's just get my pen in there so we can see. You can see multiple ring shadows, multiple ring shadows. That's cystic bronchiectasis involving the middle and lower zones of both lung fields, more so on the right than on the left. We can see that. This is bilateral bronchiectasis. This is a high resolution CT and it demonstrates very, very severely dilated airways, right, which we can see uh, represented here. Look at this, very, very dilated. Uh, cross section. This is a cross section, right? Uh, we can even see the dilated areas here as well. All right, both longitudinally and in cross section. So the arrowhead here shows it longitudinally, right? The tram lines and the uh, the the arrow here demonstrated in cross section. This is uh, a handy uh, CT. I just want to draw attention to traction bronchiectasis here, right? So this is traction bronchiectasis that we can see. Uh, but what's probably very uh, obvious is honeycombing at the peripheries. So basal kind of honeycombing, traction bronchiectasis, which you can see, all right, with a focal ground glass appearance, right? And this is in keeping with usual interstitial pneumonia. Okay, so we've done our X-ray, we've done our HRCT. In terms of the blood work, you want to do a full blood count and erythrocyte sedimentation rate to rule out infection. 
and indeed if you have a high ASR that also speaks to infection, do your differential count, you may have a neutrophilic leukocytosis in the setting of bacterial infection, which often exacerbates chronic lung disease such as bronchiectasis. A good idea to do X-ray of the paranasal sinuses uh, for catagonist syndrome. Uh, lung function test is usually obstructive but can be uh, restrictive in advanced cases as in the clinical case that we presented. A good idea is to do sputum. You can send it off for gram stain, acephas, bacilli for gene expert, caution sensitivity and cytology if necessary. Sometimes do a bronchoscopy to establish the site of the lesion but that's in selected cases. If you're thinking about allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis as a cause of bronchiectasis, it's prudent to do an aspergillus precipitin antibody or a skin prick test. And of course, don't forget your serum immunoglobulins, especially if you're thinking about hypogammaglobulinemia, as 10% of adults with bronchiectasis have an antibody deficiency, mainly the mucosal type, which is IgA. Other tests in the right clinical context is sweat chloride test. Uh, if you're thinking about cystic fibrosis, mucosillary clearance, that is where we're measuring the nasal clearance of saccharin, normally it's less than 30 minutes. If uh, longer than 30 minutes, it suggests ciliary dysfunction. N nasal nitric oxide is useful for screening for primary ciliary dyskinesia. It's often very low in the setting of a primary ciliary dyskinetic syndrome. Further investigation in a specialist center may be warranted. Urine for proteinuria, if you're thinking about amyloidosis. Remember, amyloidosis is one of the causes of bilaterally enlarged kidneys and ultrasound. Ultrasound abdomen, if you're thinking about sinus inverses. Right? What is really the role of CT scan in diagnosis of bronchiectasis as well? Conventional CT has a sensitivity of 60 to 80% for the diagnosis of bronchiectasis, but high resolution CT has a sensitivity of over 90%. Now, the difference between standard CT and high resolution CT is that in standard CT, the resolution is just 10 millimeters thick, but in high resolution, like the name implies, high resolution CT scan, resolution is much thinner, which is about 1 to 2 millimeters thick, so therefore it's more sensitive for. Um, bronchiectasis and interstitial lung diseases. And also the added benefit is that we don't have to administer contrast when you're doing a high resolution CT, but in a normal chest CT you do have to administer contrast. Now what's the treatment for bronchiectasis? Good to do postural drainage. So basically this means that you're keeping the affected part remaining up and percuss over it. It's done for 5-10 to 10 minutes once or twice daily. Uh, get your physiotherapy team involved, the chest physio, Daily airway clearance therapy, so active cycling of breathing, or rather active cycles of breathing techniques may be used. There are numerous devices to assist in this, which provide some kind of PEEP, which is positive expiratory pressure, with or without airway oscillation. Nebulized hypertonic saline may also be helpful. Antibiotic, good idea if there's an exacerbation, usually it's an effective exacerbation. So and the usual culprits are Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Haemophilus influenza, the common uh, culprits, right? For pseudomonas aeruginosa, we can give ciprofloxacin, 750 milligram BD um, pause. But if you're in hospital, might as well just give IV. Uh, Haemophilus influenza, you can use. Coamoxylab or doxy may be used. In multi-resistant species, IV cephalosporin may be given. Right, a mucolytic is a good idea for those thick, tenacious, viscous secretions. An example is the N-acetylcysteine, bromhexine, uh, carbocysteine, and erdosteine. Bronchodilator drugs, so your NEBS, you give your beta to agonist, right, uh, which is salbutamol in the setting of bronchial asthma, COPD, cystic fibrosis, ABPA, right, inhaled or oral or IV steroids are shown to decrease the rate of progression, especially helpful in ABPA. Long-term azithromycin, now azithromycin has an immunomodulatory effect. Yes, it's a macrolide antibiotic and covers atypical organisms, but it also has an immunomodulatory effect, which is beneficial and is, has been shown to reduce the frequency of exacerbations. You've got to get vaccinations on board, COVID vaccine, influenza vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine. All righty, surgery as well in the way of lobectomy. If this bilateral extensive bronchiectasis, lung transplant may be required. Okay, everybody. So we coming back. We turn up the Mac. 51-year-old woman. She came in with daily productive cough, thick, tenacious sputum, usually worse in the morning, occasional blood streaked. Cough began seven years ago, getting worse. Uh, she coughs up about half a cup a day. She's often having antibiotics for exacerbations, which are infective in nature, together with sinus infections. You have bilateral cost creps, and she's clubbed. Uh, PFT shows a restrictive pattern. Um, sputum culture goes to the monosotrichinosa. What test would you perform next in the evaluation of this patient? Drum roll. High-risk CT. 
high-res CT. So the diagnosis of bronchiectasis is determined by the presence of disease on chest CT imaging. Now, chest radiography is, as we said, not sensitive for the diagnosis of bronchiectasis, particularly early in the disease process, but you can see TAM tracking, right, which speaks to dilated airway. The test, the money-throwing test of choice is a high-resolution CT, and that is definitely the diagnostic modality of choice. As we said, it demonstrates dilated, non-tapering airways that may be filled and impacted with mucus. The signaling sign when the airway is greater than 1.5 times the size of the adjacent blood vessel, right, bronchial wall thickening, we've got inspissated secretions with a tree and bud pattern and cysts emanating from our bronchial wall. Okay, my friends, I just want to talk about gladness today. I just want to quote two scriptures which speak about gladness, right? Psalm 40 verse 16 says, let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such love your salvation and say continually, the Lord be magnified. First Chronicles 16.10 says, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Uh, the book of Philippians tells us, beloved, I think it's Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You know, when you have the peace of the Holy Spirit in your heart, He gives you joy that the world can never understand. The only joy that the Lord Jesus can give you. Let us pray. Let us seek His face. Let us be filled with the joy of the Lord. Here are my references, everybody. Uh, we'll be covering pneumothorax on the next video. Looking forward to that one. You take care. God bless you. And see you soon.